This video is brought to you by BizWire TV, where your news is made. Good morning, everyone. I'd like to thank IR Magazine for giving me the opportunity to present today and for you all to coming along. I'm going to take you through a short presentation and then be happy to answer any questions afterwards. So having spent over a decade as a sell-side analyst before joining Ganel, I've seen things from both sides of the fence. And today I'd like to talk to you about my, uh, my in-house experience of investor relations against the backdrop of a quite a challenging macro environment for our business over the past couple of years. So in order to do this, I would like to give you an introduction to Ganel for those who are not familiar with the investment case. So hopefully this will work. It does. Uh, we are an independent oil and gas exploration company uh, listed on the main board of the LSC. We are one of the largest leading independent oil producers listed in London. We produced 55,000 barrels a day uh, in the first nine months of this year. At the end of last year, we had over 1.25 billion barrels of oil equivalent, and all of our reserves, resources, and production is in the Kurdistan region of northern Iraq. Now, the Kurdistan region is a semi-autonomous region of Iraq. Well, what does that mean? It means that the regional government in the Kurdistan region exercises significant control and influence over day-to-day -day life. So one of the matters which the regional government believes it has responsibility for under the Iraqi constitution is control over uh, the development and export of its oil. That's not been without issues. The federal government in Baghdad has claimed uh, oil oil, all oil sales by the regional government, including ours, is illegal. From the moment our company was listed on the LSE back in 2011, a significant part of the IR program has been educating existing and potential investors in our business on the internal politics in Iraq and the natural resource potential of the region. We also have some exploration licenses offshore Morocco and onshore Somaliland. Uh, the Kurdistan region and Somaliland are what some people might call frontier areas. Mm -hmm. um, but with the days of easy oil gone, we and our peers now have to look at areas with either technical or political risk. It's a strategy that can bring success, but also IR challenges. This slide is a regional map illustrating the location of our main producing oil fields. Our two oil fields, uh, Tak Tak and Torquay, uh, they have been developed and operate at very low costs. That's a key competitive advantage for our company. Oil produced from these fields is commingled with other fields in the region, principally around the city of Kirkuk, and exported through this pipeline down to the Mediterranean port of Chehan in Turkey, where it is sold on world markets. It's not shown on this map, but located close to our Tak Tak oil field are two giant gas fields which we own, which we're aiming to monetize and develop through a pipeline to supply gas to Turkey. Now, as you can see from the proximity of our fields and the Kurdistan region to Mosul, I'm not surprised to hear that the geographical location of our assets is the key driver behind the challenging macro backdrop we've had to deal with over the past couple of years. It was good to hear the Berenberg guys talk about site visits. If anybody's interested in going to Iraq, <laughs> please register your interest afterwards. <laughs> so I've listed the challenges that we've had to face on this slide. All oil and gas producers, to a greater or lesser extent, have been impacted by the slide in the oil price over the past two years. However, the impact on Ganel and its peers in the Kurdistan region has been compounded by the financial stress that that slide in the oil price has placed on the regional government, for which oil exports are its only significant source of revenue. The regional government is the counterparty for our oil sales, i.e. they pay us for the oil that we produce. We are currently owed over $400 million by the Kurdistan regional government for oil that we have produced, which we have not been paid for, a figure in excess of our market capitalization. As well as the fiscal issues, the political backdrop has also been a significant challenge, particularly the emergence of ISIS as a major disruptive force in Iraq for mid-2014, elevated security concerns to the top of the agenda for all oil companies uh, operating in the Kurdistan region. 
were also a Turkish business by origin. Uh, as a result, instability in Turkey, including the attempted coup earlier this year, raises the risk perception for investors in our stock. So if that weren't enough, <laughs> we have also suffered from some adverse operating performance, including this pipeline being disrupted time to time by, uh, by terrorists, and also from some adverse operating performance, particularly at one of our main assets. So having said all that, this share price chart may not come as a surprise, although it's no, no doubt will send a shiver down the spine of many investor relations professionals listening to this talk. And it tells a pretty sorry tale, which one I'm not particularly proud of, and no one again knows either. A combination of the factors I've just described has led our share price to fall from 90, by 90% 90 since the beginning of 2014. We've underperformed both the oil price and also the FTSE 350 oil and gas index. So, what are the lessons to take away from this experience? Institutional investors in companies such as ours understand that when they're investing in a company that has operations in the Kurdistan region, they're investing in a company with a higher risk profile than most. And that should be part of their due diligence before they invest. So what we tended to prioritize long-term EM value funds uh, over energy specialists when we've done our targeting. EM investors, by definition, have a higher risk tolerance, which should expedite the diligence process on a company such as ours. So as a result, we have had a number of substantial, top-tier, very recognizable institutional investors over the past two years who have not only maintained their positions as the share price has declined, but added to them in order to average down their in price. So key to that was constant engagement with those investors during periods of political instability. We may not have been able to give definitive answers to questions such as what threat does ISIS pose to the borders of the Kurdistan region or to your oil fields, but by staying in close contact with both the buy and sell side during this period, we were able to offer background and insights which were valuable to the investment process. Having said that, clearly some institutional investors are incapable of suffering the losses that this share price chart says before uh, they decided to exit that position. And unfortunately, they tend to unwind those positions quite quickly, which can compound share price weakness. As our market cap has fallen, the holdings of retail investors have grown. That's both an opportunity, but also a challenge. A supported base of retail shareholders is an obvious benefit at a time when your equity, sto when your equity story sorry, is temporarily challenged, although those shareholders can prove demanding to service, particularly at times where your share price is volatile. So we sit here today, what are the challenges that any prospective <coughs> investor in our company has to focus on before they decide to invest? So first and foremost, Iraq and its oil production and export generate a significant amount of coverage and research from the media, sell side, consultants, etc. If trying to wade through all of that wasn't enough, not all of it is objective and or uh, well informed and should be taken with a pinch of salt. So a potential investor has to spend a disproportionate amount of time relative to their holding in the stock, uh, monitoring news wires, and then needs to decide what's relevant. So I see it as our job to steer investors to the reputable stories and provide insight that allows them for an informed investment choice. As I said up front, the sentiment around our shares particularly revolves around the ability of the Kurdistan regional government to pay us for the oil that we produce. So whilst it's quite easy to calculate how much revenue they're generating because their exports are a matter of public record in real time, their cost base is very difficult to work out, and also our priority within that on a month-by-month -month basis is also difficult to work out. So again, we try to provide insight here, mainly in the form of updates from senior and operational management to the market, given our close contacts in both the Kurdistan region and Turkey. Again, we're also in the unfortunate position of having some uncertainty over the amount of oil remaining in one of our two producing oil fields, which directly impacts on the base value of our business. 
So taking all this into consideration, you may think I've got quite a tough job. <laughs> but the point is to address these challenges as we try to rebuild confidence in the company and its investment case. And we're under, under no illusion that that will take time and that some of these challenges can't be addressed overnight. But we believe that they can be addressed. So over the past couple of years, we've tried to be very consistent in focusing on the factors that are within our control whilst recognising quite a few of them aren't. And for an oil business, that main factor that you can control are costs, as your top line is usually driven by, an oil, by the oil price. So we're very, very lucky that the oil, our oil fields are, can be developed and operated at a very low cost by any standard. Uh, this also results in our business being very defensive to lower oil prices. So we've used that cost advantage as the focus of our corporate communications over the past couple of years and have continued to reiterate it. That simple message has actually been quite useful uh, in building our uh, investment case or investor targeting strategy around. Uh, so for example, the amount of money that we have received from the government for our oil sales this year has more than covered the amount of money we've invested in the fields, so CapEx, the amount of money we've spent running the fields, OPEX, debt servicing and GNA. And that's actually not something many oil companies can say. Of course, we get to see and read most of the media commentary and the sell side research on us and the Kurdistan region. And where, when we come across something that's particularly interesting or illuminating, and where possible, we try to distribute that to the investment community. So by doing that, there's an obligation on us to be objective in particular and disseminate information that's useful, timely and informative even, e even if it isn't of immediate benefit to us. As part of the process to try and short circuit the amount of time the investment community has to spend on our stock in the Kurdistan region and all of that incremental news flow, we have in the past offered briefing calls to top shareholders with management I guess above and beyond what might cons be considered as best practice in terms of the amount of management time that is spent talking to shareholders. I'm also very active engaging with analysts and in particular very very focused on analyst forecasts and we're always very quick to pick up on any errors or deviations from consensus and guidance and that's because the contracts which govern how much revenue we generate from our fields are a matter of public record. And so therefore, there shouldn't really be any excuse for analysts to get that wrong. So where appropriate, we also provide enhanced insight into accounting methodologies, assumptions underlying our payments from the government to ensure that the, the range of dispersion around analyst forecasts is as low as possible. We also ran a, an in-depth perception study earlier this year uh, the feedback from that was quite hard hitting, but that's what we'd requested, and we have as much broker feedback as we possibly can. So, combining those two uh, allows us to get as much market feedback as possible in real time, and that helps uh, when we're evolving our corporate messaging. Finally, I would say that despite the issues we've had over the past year, I would hope that our shareholders respect us for striking the right balance between objectivity and promotion of the investment case when times have been tough. So that's the end of my prepared remarks, and uh, I'm sure we'll have some time for questions if anybody wants to ask them. We do have uh, plenty of time for questions. And, and once again, I'll uh, kick off, if I may. Um, speaking as a jobbing journalist, uh, you know, no vested interest here at all to her. Uh, you've uh, mentioned that uh, yeah, you, you're quite right, not all of the coverage of the regions you, in which you operate is uh, unbiased, uh, there, and so it is your job to put forward the objective uh, version to your, your clients, your investors. How do you establish a relationship whereby they can trust you not to just give them another slanted version, uh, which is slanted in your favour rather than actually objective? I think because there are so many sources of information that it becomes very clear straight away if we're spinning a yarn. Mm -hmm. So we give them an object objective view. If that is, if they believe that's subjective, they will find that out pretty quickly. So I don't think there is much opportunity really for us to be overly promotional with either the press, consultants, the sell side or the buy side. Okay, another uh, issue that uh, um, I 
was interested in that you raised was uh, that a lot of your investors were uh, not swayed uh, by short-term uh, political uh, or short-term geopolitical, shall we say, incidents. How are you defining short-term there? Because I wouldn't have thought ISIS was all that short-term, but uh, you know, perhaps you do. What's your uh, criteria there? Well, I think a company such as ours, you know, you're talking at least three years. So I must admit, quite a few of our major shareholders were quite rattled by what happened back in 2014. And there were days when you have, for example, one piece of news flow which appeared on Bloomberg was that uh, ISIS was about 20 kilometers from one of our oil fields. And that was then compounded by what, uh, what, who will unnamed, uh, an unnamed analyst who actually got his compass wrong and put ISIS within one of our assets. Mm. Yeah. Hence a pretty robust conversation with them around <coughs> that, as you can imagine. Um, but you know, that, that was a pretty very, very difficult time because the share price was reacting to information that we didn't know, we, we didn't have any visibility mm. on. So we say we're very, very honest when we speak to investors and say there will be news, there will be times like this where the share price is very volatile around news flow in this region. So you have to be prepared for that if you're investing in this, in this stock. Yeah. Simple as that. Okay. Um, other uh, questions from the floor do we have? Yes, a uh, question over here, please. Um. Sorry, I'm just, it's just a curiosity, but um, if, if you're monitoring news flow, I mean, in the end, everyone monitors news flow, surely you have your own sources of information, because you, just for the security of your own employees, you need to know if ISIS was 20 miles down the road. I mean, you need someone to tell you that. Don't, can't you share that sort of information with everybody, which is yes. then potentially yeah, yeah. more interesting and more compelling for people who are talking to? Yeah, you, yes, you can. And I think in those kind of examples, which is you know, there is an immediate, potentially immediate threat to people, most particularly, and, and your assets, then that should be a, a corporate communication. So that should be a stock exchange release. And at that time, we did pump out quite a few releases to ensure the market that our people were safe, first and foremost, and our assets were not in any danger. Uh, but the difficulty is, and I'm sure everybody's experienced it, you publish a story, and even if you get somebody to retract it, then the damage has probably been done by that point. So we keep very, very close relationships with all of the major media organizations for that, for that reason and, and other reasons, obviously, as well. Um, but yes, you know, that, that, that is a very, very important part of the job that we're doing to make sure that the messaging is correct. And also that in, sometimes the messaging can actually cause us direct harm as well, because you may get people in the organization concerned for their welfare if they re re read a news report which puts them, which puts actors erroneously very, very close to your assets as well. So yeah, it takes up quite a lot of our time, but we do try to use the insights that we have where possible, and obviously you have the disclosure issues and to think about around this as well, but where possible to put the record straight. Where there is an issue where you have to put the record straight, do you actually get uh, papers giving the same prominence to the correction as the, I don't even have to ask, do I? Do they give the same prominence to the correction as they did to the original story? No. Ever? No? Not, not, well, not really, because whether it's a media <coughs> organisation or a sell side analyst, they don't want to say that they've got it wrong. As a journalist, I think I'll just go quiet on that one. <laughs> yes, do we, we have another question, please? Um, Could we just wait for the mic? Thank you. Um, I'm actually interested in, not just in the sort of short-term uh, dramas, but in the, the I suppose, medium-term geopolitical stuff. I mean, do you find yourself having to give seminars on the likelihood of, you know, the Kurds having their own state in your region, which is being discussed, particularly because of the Peshmerga's involvement in Mosul? I'd say that we have a view, although I wouldn't say that it's, uh, it's the job of the management team to stand up in a public forum to give a view mm. on something which we actually don't control. But I think for investors have a right to ask the management team about the future of the Kurdistan region and what it means for us. Mm. And I think that that, but that message is, is the most appropriate forum for that is sort of one-to-one -one or group meetings with investors rather than giving that kind of information. Mm. I'll be very interested to see what your next job is. <laughs> <laughs> something in damage limitation, I would imagine. <laughs> 
Thanks. If we could all restrain from uh, off, uh, wishing the speakers good luck in your next job, um, <laughs> that that was fine. But you know, what, any more, and it's just not going to not going to not going to play well. Do we have any further questions from the uh, from the floor? Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank you.